The following program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Andrew Womack Ministries, celebrating 50 years of sharing God's unconditional love and grace. Uh, one of the great teachings that um, we studied through Andrew's ministry was uh, grace, the power of the gospel. It was profound and I got such revelation off of that that it just changed my relationship with God. It changed the way I looked at myself and it, it was uh, just an incredible experience when I, when I received that revelation through Andrew's ministry. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, Andrew continues teaching from the life-changing Word of God about grace, the power of the gospel. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today is the end of my first week teaching through the book of Romans. We're still in Romans chapter 1. There's 16 chapters in Romans, but this isn't going to be a 16-week series. I'm going to speed up, but I've been really emphasizing Romans chapter 1 verses 16 and 17. To me, this is kind of like the nail that holds everything else. You know, this is the uh, linchpin of the whole teaching that Paul did in the book of Romans. It's all about the gospel, talking about the grace of God available to us on an unearned, undeserved basis. Let me just mention again that I've got a book on this entitled Grace, the Power of the Gospel. I've got it in CD, DVD, and also in a study guide. And if you've missed any of the teaching this week, I encourage you to go to our website and check out these programs and listen to this because this is the gospel. The gospel today uh, is a cliche that people apply to all kinds of things, talking about God's angry at you, that God's mad. They use it to condemn people. But the word gospel literally means good news. It's not good news to know that you're going to hell. It may be true. It's not good news to know that you're a sinner. It may be true, but it's not good news. The good news is specifically designating the fact that even though there is a hell and then even though we have all sin and come short of the glory of God, that God placed our sin upon Jesus and He offers us right standing with Him, not based on our performance, but just based on faith receiving what Jesus did for us. That's the gospel. That's the nearly too good to be true news unto salvation. And then he said, but you don't have, you know, I knew that there was going to be people that would criticize him for saying that he's telling people about the good news, the, the gospel. And they say, no, you need to let people know that they're a sinner. Most people are driven to God out of fear. But the Bible says in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, it's the goodness of God that brings men to salvation. But the religion basically is trying to drive them there out of fear. God wants to draw people out of love. And so when Paul talked about the goodness of God, he knew that the religious people were going to say, but you've got to condemn people. You've got to let people know that they're a sinner. And so he began to show that, no, they already know that they're a sinner. There's an intuitive knowledge on the inside of every person. And we dealt with all of that yesterday. And then in the rest of Romans chapter 1, he basically shows that everybody is already guilty by their own conscience. They know in their heart that there's a God and that they know that they have come short of being the person that God created them to be. So there's this intuitive knowledge that condemns every person. And then in chapter 2, he begins to start talking to the religious Jews who were trying to impose the law upon people who had a relationship with Jesus and saying, Jesus isn't enough. You've also got to live holy. And he began to start showing in chapter 2 that the religious Jews were doubly guilty because they not only had the intuitive knowledge of God and of right and wrong in their heart, but they also had the written Word of God and that law just amplified this guilt and stuff. So they were guilty by their conscience and the written law of God. So they were doubly guilty. And then in Romans chapter 3, he begins to say, so therefore, whether you are a religious Jew or whether you are a heathen, whether you're a Gentile, a person that didn't have a relationship with God, regardless of who you are, we're all condemned, either by our own conscience or by our conscience and the law. 
So religious, non-religious, we're all the same. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That is basically a summary of the first three chapters of the book of Romans. But let me just go back, and there's some things here in Romans chapter 1 that I want to deal with because this really speaks to our situation today. Today, we are seeing our society going in a direction that is completely ungodly. And the book of Romans, chapter 1, if people understood this, I guarantee you it would just stop a lot of the foolishness that's happening in our society today. So I've already talked about verses uh, down through verse 20. In verse 21, it says, "...because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God." Now, I mentioned this at the close of my program yesterday, but I have an entire series on this entitled, Discover the, uh, let's see, the four keys to staying full of God. And uh, you can get that, and it'll go into a lot of explanation. Five teachings on this one verse. But this is basically saying that even though there is this intuitive knowledge of right and wrong, all unrighteousness, all ungodliness is shown in verse 18. It's revealed in them in verse 19. In verse 20, it says they even understand His eternal power and Godhead, and it's clearly seen. But in verse 21, he says that you can walk away from it. You can deaden yourself to this intuitive knowledge that God put in everybody. And the way you do it is to not glorify God. Man, there is a lot in that. Again, I would encourage you to get that series on the four keys to staying full of God. But they don't glorify God. They aren't thankful. They become vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart is darkened. And then look at this in verse 22. It says, professing themselves to be wise... They became fools. Man, this is so descriptive. This is descriptive of our society today. We've got people who go and get these degrees, and because men have conferred upon them some kind of a degree, they claim superior knowledge, superior wisdom, and yet they're fools. And I know that this is offensive to people, I'm not trying to offend people, but I'm telling you, a person that can't see God in creation is a fool. And I don't mean that malicious. I'm not trying to hurt anybody, but man, you know, I mentioned yesterday that you could take the cumulative power, intellectual knowledge of the human race, and they can't create one blade of grass that will reproduce itself. They can create something that'll look like it. And if we can't do that on purpose... Man, all you got to do is look at a piece of grass, at a leaf, at a tree, at a person, at the sky, at the stars, at the sun, at the moon. And if you can't see God, you're a fool. I don't mean that maliciously, but it's a fool. It says in Psalms chapter 14, verse 1, and Psalms chapter 53, verse 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And we've got a lot of people today in our society who are professing themselves to be wise because they've got degrees. You know, you could have 32 degrees and still be frozen if you're going by the Fahrenheit scale. Man, that doesn't mean anything. A person that can't see God is an absolute fool. Again, no malicious intention there, but I'm just saying that, man, why in the world would we listen to people that can't see God, that think all of this complexity and everything that we see just happened by chance? You got to be, you know, dumb to the second power to believe that. Dumb, dumb. And I know that there's people right now, because what I'm saying is so contrary to our society today, that they are just totally discounting me, rejecting me, and saying, man, you are weird. You are out there on the fringe. But I'm not saying anything that the Bible doesn't say. They profess themselves to be wise, but they become fools. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Fool here isn't talking about that you're a terrible person or anything like that, but you're foolish. You aren't wise. You aren't smart. Psalms chapter 19, verse 1, The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day utters speech. Night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no tongue or language where this hasn't gone forth. It's gone forth into all of the earth. Man, creation is just shouting God every time you turn around. Now, you can deaden yourself to it, and that's what these verses are talking about, and this has happened today. Evolution, 
the belief in evolution has caused many people to just deaden themselves towards this intuitive knowledge of God. But I can guarantee you it's there. And if you would get quiet and if you would honestly consider what I'm saying, I guarantee you that little homing device that God placed on the inside of you would begin to start drawing you to God and let you know there has to be a God. You know, if somehow or another I could go to Mars, and if I landed on Mars, and if I found a house that was built, and a television that was in there, and a refrigerator, and a bed, and couch, and chairs, and if those things were on Mars, I guarantee you, you would be absolutely foolish not to believe that some person didn't live there. Just to think that that just happened. And yet this is inanimate. It's not alive. It can't reproduce. They send these things to Mars and they find just some trace that there was water at one time. And they think, man, there had to be life on Mars. And they get it from the slightest little thing. And yet if they were to find a, a house there and if somebody says, well, this just evolved. There weren't people here. You would be an absolute fool. And likewise, for people to look at our creation and everything that is here on this earth and to think that it evolved, you are a fool to think that this just happened. I've had people liken this to, I read a thing that if a bomb went off in a Boeing airplane factory, and if this bomb went off and somehow or another all of those parts that were there formed a 747 jet, that could fly, that had all of the seats in there, and everything was totally functional. The chances of a bomb causing all of these parts to assemble and come into a 747 are like infinitely greater that that would happen than that some slime would evolve into a complex being. It's actually a better chance of a bomb going off in a printing press and producing a Bible that is printed perfectly, every word is correct, all of the pages are assembled, it's bound, it's stacked. It's The chances of that happening through an explosion in a printing press are millions of times greater than just chance producing people and all of the animal life and plant life that we see on this planet. I tell you what, you got to have more faith than I've got to believe in evolution. It's so much easier to believe that there's a God who created the heavens and the earth. And so it says, They profess themselves to be wise, but they become fools, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. This is talking about idolatry, people building an idol and worshiping it. And you know, in our society today, Western society, idols have pretty much... Uh, you know, been rejected, but we still have idolatry. It says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, that covetousness is idolatry. We worship the almighty dollar. And you know what? I've actually met Christians, people who are born again, but they form God in their own image. I've actually had people who've heard me teach on grace, which is what all of this teaching out of the book of Romans is on. And they came out of so much legalism and they were so bound by that, and it was so offensive and oppressive to them that when they heard about the grace of God and that God loved them and that God was a good God, they got set free. But then they went way past what the Bible reveals about God, and they just go to the place that now God is nothing but love, and He is not going to punish anybody. There will not be a hell. There is no such thing as a hell. And they go way over here, and you know what they're doing? They're creating an idol. They're making God in their own image. They're making God the way He wants to be. And they're ignoring what the Scripture said. For instance, in Hebrews chapter 1, it says that one of the reasons that God crowned Jesus with glory and honor is because He hated evil. We are commanded to hate evil in Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Proverbs chapter 8 and uh, I believe it's verse 13 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And on and on we could go with scriptures. And yet there's people that have taken the grace of God and they're just making a God in their own image and they're ignoring the Bible. They're ignoring the book of Revelation showing that there is coming a time that God's wrath and judgment will be poured out on those who reject Him. And they make their God in their own image. That's idolatry. 
So, you know, we, we kind of reject people bowing down to some physical image that's coated in gold today, but we still have covetousness. We still have Christians that just pick and choose which parts of the Bible they want to believe, and they make God in their own image. That's, that's idolatry. It's creating an idol. And it says in verse 24, it says, because they did these things, it says, wherefore... GOD ALSO GAVE THEM UP TO UNCLEANNESS THROUGH THE LUST OF THEIR OWN HEARTS TO DISHONOR THEIR OWN BODIES BETWEEN THEMSELVES, WHO CHANGED THE TRUTH OF GOD INTO A LIE AND WORSHIPPED AND SERVED THE CREATURE MORE THAN THE CREATOR WHO IS BLESSED FOREVER. AMEN. FOR THIS CAUSE GOD GAVE THEM UP UNTO VILE AFFECTIONS, FOR EVEN THEIR WOMEN DID CHANGE THE NATURAL USE INTO THAT WHICH IS AGAINST NATURE. THIS IS TALKING ABOUT LESBIANISM. WOMEN HAVING SEX WITH WOMEN. VERSE 27, AND LIKEWISE ALSO THE MEN, LEAVING THE NATURAL USE OF THE WOMAN, BURNED IN THEIR LUST ONE TOWARDS ANOTHER, MEN WITH MEN, WORKING THAT WHICH IS UNSEEMLY, AND RECEIVING IN THEMSELVES THAT RECOMPENSE OF THEIR ERROR, WHICH WAS MEAT. THIS IS TALKING ABOUT HOMOSEXUALITY. AGAIN, YOU KNOW, BASICALLY, IN THE FIRST CHAPTER OF ROMANS, HE'S SHOWING THAT THERE IS THIS INTUITIVE KNOWLEDGE ON THE INSIDE OF EVERY PERSON. Verse, CHAPTER 2 SHOWS THAT THE JEWS WERE DOUBLY GUILTY BECAUSE THEY NOT ONLY HAD THE INTUITIVE KNOWLEDGE, BUT THEY HAD THE REVEALED KNOWLEDGE OF THE LAW, AND THAT JUST AMPLIFIED THEIR SIN. AND THEN CHAPTER 3 SHOWS, SO WE'RE ALL GUILTY BEFORE GOD. WE ALL NEED A SAVIOR. AND THAT'S THE POINT THAT'S BEING MADE. BUT THE REASON I WANT TO JUST GO THROUGH THESE VERSES HERE IN CHAPTER 1 IS BECAUSE OUR SOCIETY TODAY HAS THROWN OFF THE INSTRUCTIONS OF THE WORD OF GOD, AND THEY ARE JUST FORMING THEIR OWN IDOL. THEY ARE PROFESSING THEMSELVES TO BE WISE, AND THEY'RE SAYING THAT WE HAVE EVOLVED AND STUFF, AND WHAT THEY'VE DONE IS DE-EVOLVE DOWN INTO PERVERSION. I'VE ACTUALLY HAD PEOPLE BEFORE SAY, WELL, THE BIBLE DOESN'T EVEN TALK ABOUT HOMOSEXUALITY. THE WORD HOMOSEXUAL ISN'T EVEN USED IN THE BIBLE. MAN, HOW DUMB CAN YOU GET AND STILL BREATHE? <laughs> DID YOU KNOW THAT THE WORD HOMOSEXUAL IS ONLY INVENTED A HUNDRED OR MAYBE TWO HUNDRED YEARS AGO, MAX, SOMETHING LIKE THAT? IT'S A MODERN TERM, BUT th THIS IS TALKING ABOUT HOMOSEXUALITY. WOMEN BURNING IN THEIR LUST TOWARDS OTHER WOMEN. MEN LEAVING THE NATURAL USE OF THE WOMAN. THEY BURNED IN THEIR LUST ONE TOWARDS ANOTHER. MEN WITH MEN WORKING THAT WHICH IS UNSEEMLY AND RECEIVING IN THEMSELVES THAT RECOMPENSE OF THEIR ERROR WHICH WAS MEAT. And THIS IS TALKING ABOUT ALL OF THIS COMMUNICABLE DISEASES, AIDS, AND ALL OF THIS KIND OF STUFF. THIS ISN'T NEW. MAN, HOMOSEXUALITY IS A PERVERSION, AND IT CAUSES PROBLEMS, AND THAT'S WHAT THIS IS TALKING ABOUT. AND IT SAYS THAT GOD GAVE THEM UP. The, IT IS DESCRIBING HOMOSEXUALITY AS A RESULT OF PEOPLE REJECTING THIS INTUITIVE KNOWLEDGE OF GOD THAT WAS PUT ON THE INSIDE OF THEM, AND THEY PERSIST EVEN AGAINST GOD'S CONVICTION AGAINST THEIR SIN. AND BECAUSE OF THAT, GOD JUST BEGINS TO START TAKING THIS CONVICTION AWAY FROM THEM. YOU KNOW, IN JOHN CHAPTER 6 AND VERSE 44, IT SAYS, NO MAN CAN COME TO ME EXCEPT THE FATHER WHICH HATH SENT ME DRAW HIM, AND I WILL RAISE HIM UP AT THE LAST DAY. IN OTHER WORDS, WE DON'T SEEK GOD JUST ON OUR OWN. WE ONLY SEEK GOD AS THE HOLY SPIRIT DRAWS US. AND IF THE HOLY SPIRIT QUITS DRAWING US, YOU WON'T SEEK GOD ON YOUR OWN. YOU KNOW, IF YOU'RE WATCHING THIS PROGRAM TODAY ON A CHRISTIAN TELEVISION SET, THERE IS SOME CURIOSITY, THERE IS SOME DRAWING. YOU MAY BE FULL OUT SEEKING GOD WITH YOUR WHOLE HEART, BUT AT THE VERY LEAST, YOU HAVE A CURIOSITY AND YOU'RE CHECKING SOMETHING OUT YOU KNOW WHAT THAT IS? THAT'S THE HOLY SPIRIT DRAWING you. YOU. ON YOUR OWN, YOU WOULD NEVER WATCH THIS PROGRAM. YOU WOULD NEVER CONSIDER THE CLAIMS OF CHRISTIANITY. YOU WOULD NEVER CONSIDER GOD ON YOUR OWN. IF YOU ARE WATCHING THIS PROGRAM, IT'S BECAUSE THE HOLY SPIRIT IS DRAWING YOU AND BRINGING YOU UNTO HIMSELF. BUT IF HE QUITS DRAWING YOU, I GUARANTEE YOU, AND LEAVES YOU ON YOUR OWN, THEN YOU ARE IN A DOWNWARD SPIRAL. NOW, GOD IS LONG-SUFFERING. AND I BELIEVE THAT GOD DEALS WITH US OFTEN UP UNTIL THE VERY la LAST BREATH THAT WE BREATHE. PEOPLE GET BORN AGAIN ON THEIR DEATHBED. THE THIEF ON THE CROSS GOT BORN AGAIN, I MEAN JUST MOMENTS BEFORE HE DIED. AND PRAISE GOD FOR HIS MERCY AND GRACE. BUT THERE IS NO PROMISE FROM GOD THAT HE'S GOING TO GIVE YOU UP UNTIL YOUR LAST BREATH. IF YOU HARDEN YOURSELF AND RESIST THE THINGS OF GOD AND JUST REJECT HIS CONVICTION OVER AND OVER AND OVER, 
There is no promise. There is no guarantee. God is not obligated to keep giving you chances up until your last breath. And if He was to withdraw the drawing of His Holy Spirit and the conviction of His Holy Spirit and leave you on your own, you are damned. You have no chance of ever coming to God on your own. You don't seek God. You don't find God. You know, we often say, I found God. The truth is God wasn't lost. We were the ones that were lost. God pursued us. God draws us unto Himself. And if He ever quits drawing us, man, that is a terrible state to be in. And this is what this is describing. It's showing that there was an intuitive knowledge on the inside of every person of God's existence. But you can harden yourself. You can profess yourself to be wise. You can adopt the attitudes of this world and you can deaden yourself towards this inner witness that God has put. And if that happens, God will just let you go. And it's describing homosexuality as God loosening this control and this conviction because of the hardness of our heart. And look what it goes on to say. It says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. The word reprobate here is talking about that God took all of this inner witness, this conviction away. Now again, there are some people say, I have no conviction over sin. There's one of two things happening. Either they are lying because in their heart there's this intuitive knowledge on the inside of every person, or they have gone so far, they have rejected God so much that God gave them over to this reprobate mind, and He has taken all conviction away from them. And once that happens, there is no hope of salvation. It's one of those two things. And I think with the majority of people, they still have a conscience. They still are being convicted by God, but they're just in the process of denying it. But this is a dangerous situation to be given over to a reprobate mind to where God won't draw you. Again, go back to John 6, 44. Unless the Holy Spirit draws you, you can't come to God on your own. And then it says, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Man, this is just like you're reading the paper today. You could look on the front page of any newspaper in our country and find every one of these things are in epidemic proportion. Disobedient to parents. Man, that is nearly the norm today without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, meaning they don't feel loyalty to family, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Man, this is descriptive of our world. And the reason I'm bringing this out is to say that when a person just continually resists this inner witness of God and rejects Him, There is no obligation for God to keep drawing you. He is long-suffering, but it didn't say He was forever suffering. And a person can pass a point of no return to where God will just give you over to a reprobate mind, and it's describing all of these things that are prevalent in our society today as attributes, characteristics of a reprobate mind. And homosexuality, if it's not crossing the line into being reprobate, it's right up against it. It's one of the last steps. And our society is pushing in that direction. Romans chapter 1 condemns this as being a reprobate mind. Man, we need to get on to the Word of God. Let me just once again promote this book. This book is a summary of the first nine, maybe nine and a half chapters of the book of Romans. It would be a blessing to you. I've also got CDs, DVDs, and a study guide. Listen as our announcer gives you information about how you can get this, and then please call or write today. Gain a greater understanding of what Jesus did for you through God's grace when you get Andrew's teaching on Romans titled, Grace, the Power of the Gospel. It's available in either a CD or a DVD album made from our daily television broadcast. You can also get this teaching as a book or a companion study guide available in either English or Spanish. Each of these valuable resources are available for a gift of any amount. I really recommend that you get this teaching on the grace of God as taught through the Apostle Paul's teaching from the book of Romans. This is powerful. And this book is entitled Grace, the Power of the Gospel. 
I tell you, if this doesn't light your fire, your wood is wet. This will just be a blessing to you. I also not only have the book, but I have this study guide that is designed to help you teach other people. Once you understand the true gospel of the Lord, you are going to want to share this with somebody else. And then we also have CDs where I taught this and then DVDs that were taken from my television program. I tell you, this would really help you. You don't get this in just one time listening to it. You need to go over and over it, and plus you need to share this with other people. If you'd like a verse-by-verse -verse commentary on Romans, consider Andrew's Life for Today's Study Bible and Commentary, Romans Edition. It includes 470 footnotes that will help you understand God's unconditional love and grace. Or if you prefer, all of these resources are available as part of the Romans Collection. It includes your choice of either the CD or DVD album, the book, the study guide, and the Life for Today Study Bible and Commentary, Romans Edition. Order the collection today, and while supplies last, you'll also receive a special Andrew Womack Ministries inscribed mug from our store. The Romans Collection has a catalog value of $124, but you can receive it today for just $75. The first audio teaching in today's series is available for a gift of any amount when you write or call. We encourage everyone to give, but if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this first CD free of charge. You can order resources or become a Grace Partner through our website at awmi.net or call our helpline Monday through Friday from 4.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Our helpline number is 719-635-1111. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. You know, if you would like to come to Karis Bible College, but you just can't bring it on yourself to leave where you are and move out here, I would like to let you know that we have extension schools all over the United States as well as many foreign countries. And uh, we have morning classes, night classes, we have Saturday classes where you meet just two Saturdays a month and do the rest by correspondence. There's many ways for you to take advantage, so go check out our website and see if there is a Karis Bible College close to you. As Karis continues to grow, new locations are constantly being added. Students are being equipped through the Word of God and grounded in the message of God's unconditional love and grace. With over 70 locations worldwide and brand new ones starting, there is a Karis waiting for you. Please go to karisbiblecollege.org slash mycampus to find a campus opening near you. Hi, I'm James Brown. Men, I'm inviting you to come to the 2018 Men's Advance at Karis Bible College. Andrew Womack, myself, and Hall of Fame coach Tony Dungy will be speaking on how to win from within and to train for greatness. You won't want to miss the 2018 Men's Advance. Andrew, Tony, and I want to see you there. The 2018 Men's Advance, March 8th through the 10th. Register at awmi.net slash events.